Well, good morning, and in some ways, uh, it's good to be back home. Uh, my wife and I got married in May of 1978 on a uh, Saturday night. Uh, on Sunday, we drove to Dallas, Texas on Monday. Praise the Lord. It was a Memorial Day, so we got to stay home. Tuesday, she went to work, and I went back to school. And uh, we lived here for 15 years. Uh, all four of our sons were born uh, at Baylor Hospital. Uh, they're off-the-scale cowboy fans, which is both good and bad, uh, more bad in recent years decades actually, but that's okay. Uh, There's always hope for next year, but uh, we loved our time in uh, Dallas at all my schooling here. And so when Daniel invited me to come and in particular to get to speak on the subject of the atonement, uh, I was greatly honored. Uh, My wife is also here with me today, Charlotte. And so we're just delighted to be a part of this wonderful church today and to look at one of the most cardinal, one of the most crucial in some cases, one of the most misunderstood doctrines in the Bible, and that is the doctrine of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So take your Bible, whatever form you have it, join me in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. There is no S at the end of that word. There are many revelations in it, but it is the book of Revelation, chapter 5. We're going to examine all 14 verses, but I'll read in preparation for our study, verse 1 reading down through verse 6. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, and here's the key question of the fifth chapter, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll and to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals and between the throne and the four living creatures. And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. One of the most popular and beloved songs sung in churches week after week is the song, In Christ Alone. Uh, It is a wonderful song full of great theology. It's a song that not only tugs at our heart, but it also fills our mind with good theology. But a number of years ago, the Presbyterian Church USA decided that uh, in Christ alone would no longer be a part of their hymnody on Sundays when they gather as a body of Christ. Now, here's what happened. They were working on a new hymnal. And they want to include Christ in Christ alone, but there is a particular part of the hymn that they just did not feel was appropriate to the modern sensibilities of the church in the 21st century. So they contacted uh, Keith Getty, Stuart Townsend, and said, look, we would like to adjust one part of the song where it says, when on the cross, as Jesus died, you can probably finish the rest of it, the wrath of God was satisfied. And they said, instead of that line, could we just change it a little bit and say, when on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. And Keith and Stuart said, no. And therefore, the song did not make the cut for the new Presbyterian hymnal. Now, let me be clear as we begin to think about the atonement this morning. It is absolutely true that when on the cross as Jesus died, The love of God was magnified. But how was the love of God magnified? Because when on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. You see, the Bible teaches with crystal clear clarity that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, number one, he died in our place. We refer to that as substitutionary atonement. He died the death that you and I should have died. Not only that, when he died on the cross as our substitute, he paid in full the penalty of our sin. The penalty of sin is death, and he died the death that you and I should have died, but now we do not have to. So he died in our place. He is our substitute. 
He paid the penalty of our sin. And how did he do that? By bearing in his body in our place the wrath and the judgment of God. In other words, there's nothing wrong with that psalm because it simply is a beautiful reflection of the truth of the Word of God when it comes to the issue of the atonement. And one of the many texts that we could look at this morning that emphasizes that, especially the aspect of sacrifice, is Revelation chapter 5. We're going to walk through this text quickly, and as we do, I'm going to address three major aspects of why Jesus Christ is worthy and how that worthiness is fleshed out in light of his atoning work, but we'll also see some other aspects of it as well. And so, three things in particular that stand out from this text that are tied to the atoning work of Christ and also his glorious resurrection. By the way, the atonement means nothing without the resurrection. He's just a Jewish martyr in the first century, nothing more. But he is not a martyr. He is a savior because he is the risen, resurrected king and Lord of the universe. And because of that, three things. Number one, Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. He is the Lord of history, and he is Lord of history for three reasons. First of all, he is Lord because of God's plan. That's what we see there in verse 1. Look at it again. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. Now, you really need to read chapter 5 with chapter 4 because in chapter 4, it is God the Father and the doctrine of creation that is the focal point. But in chapter 5, the focus shifts to God the Son and also the doctrine of salvation. And here's the argument of the Bible. Both by creation and salvation, God has a right to do with this world as he pleases. He created it, chapter 4. He redeemed it, chapter 5. And so the person on the throne in chapter 5 and verse 1 is God the Father. Of course, the throne is the place of authority. So at the place of authority, the Bible says, in his right hand which in the Semitic mind, the right hand is the hand of authority. So let's put it together again. In the place of authority and in the hand of authority, God the Father has a scroll and it is filled with information. It is written within, it is written on the back, and it is perfectly sealed up because in Revelation, which is symbolic language, apocalyptic language, numbers almost always have a symbolic meaning. No number is more important Then the number seven, it almost always stands for that which is perfect, that which is complete, or that which is full. So one more time, God the Father is at the place of authority, the throne. In his right hand, the hand of authority, he has a scroll. This scroll is filled with information, and it is perfectly sealed up. Now, the question, what's in that scroll? That's in the right hand of God the Father. And if you pick up commentaries on the book of Revelation, you'll read at least a half a dozen different opinions. But I think it's really quite simple. What is in the right hand of God the Father inside this scroll is the remainder of the book of Revelation. Because in chapter 6, God the Son, having taken the scroll from God the Father, begins to break the seven seals and the scroll is unfurled. And what you have is chapter 6 through chapter 22 of Revelation. Now, we don't have time, but if I could summarize for you this morning, what is in that scroll, I could do it in three words. Number one, it is a book of judgment or retribution. Number two, it is a book of redemption or salvation. And number three, it is a book of restoration. It is a book of judgment. In chapter six, we read of the, of the seal judgments, and there we meet the very famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the seal judgments are poured out. In Revelation chapter 8 and 9, you have the trumpet judgments, and those judgments are poured out. Then in chapter 16, you have the bowl judgments, and they're poured out. And brothers and sisters, if the Bible is true, and I believe that it is, and I know that you do as well, in the last seven years of history, Half of the world's population will be wiped out because of the righteous and just judgment of God on a world that has shaken its fist in God's face and said, no, we will not do it your way. We will choose to do it our way. And so it is a book of horrific, 
horrific judgment. But secondly, it is also a book of redemption or salvation. Let me just show you one chapter. Turn over for a moment to chapter 7, and here's what you see. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, we discover God is not through with the Jew. And in fact, there's coming a day, as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, out there in the future, there's coming a day when all of Israel will be saved. In Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says of the nation of Israel, as we move toward the end of time, they will look upon him whom they pierced, and they will weep as for an only son. No, God is not through with the Jew, and there's going to be a glorious day when there is a great revival among the Hebrew people. But God is not just going to, at the end of time, save a multitude of Jews Praise God, he's also going to save a multitude of Gentiles as well. Look at Revelation chapter 7 and look at verse 9. After this, that is after the 144,000 have been sealed to God, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. Well, where are they from, John? From every nation, from all the tribes and the peoples and the languages. They're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they're clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out. They're singing with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 is often referred to as the great missionary promise. Why? Because God has promised us that when we get to heaven, And we're gathered around the throne worshiping the Lamb. There will be people there from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Bottom line, the Bible says it is going to happen. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can get in the way of it. But then here's the question for you and me. Will we be involved in God's great global plan of redemption? Or will we be foolishly sitting on the sideline watching? Will we be involved praying for the nations? giving to reach the nations, going to the nations? Will we be involved in God's great plan? Are we going to be like many who come to church? They never think about missions. They never think about the fact there's still more than 6,000 unreached, unengaged people groups today. They never think about the fact that over half of the world's population today in the year 2024, have no access to the gospel. They will live, they will die, they will go to hell, and they will never know that Jesus Christ loves them and shed his blood to save them. I have to believe that that bothers God. I have to believe that ought to bother you and me as well. Yes, it is a book of judgment, It is a book of salvation, but it's also a wonderful book of restoration because in Revelation 21 and 22, what do we read about? A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. And there we learn that the Bible says in that place there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain because God is going to make all things new. And all of that and more is in that scroll in the right hand of God the Father. So God has a plan. But secondly, uh, he is Lord because heaven has a problem. Heaven has a problem. Go back and look at chapter 5 and verse 2. And John says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. And here's the question again. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And now here's the problem. No one. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to even look into it. And John responds, I think quite appropriately, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to even look into it. And so for just a moment in heaven, it looks like God's glorious plan is not going to come to fruition because no angel, think about it, no saint, No one is worthy to approach God the Father sitting on his throne and take that scroll out of his hand. Yes, heaven has a problem. But then number three, Jesus Christ is Lord because of his power. Look at verse 5. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Now, there are 24 elders we learn in chapter 4. I think 
They represent the redeemed of all the ages. I think the 12 uh, represent the tribes of Israel and the, re the remnant of Israel. 12 represent the church through via the apostles. So 24 elders representing the redeemed. And one of them steps up and says, John, stop your crying. John, quit weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. A messianic title. We sang about it a moment ago from Genesis chapter 49. Secondly, the root of David. Another messianic title found both in Isaiah chapter 11 in Jeremiah chapter 23. Now think about it. As the lion, he is the king. As the root of David, he is the source of all the blessings that come to God's people through God's Messiah. So we don't have to cry. We don't have to weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He's conquered. He's prevailed. He's overcome. And he and he alone can open the scroll and it's seven sealed. And that's why Jesus Christ is, first of all, the Lord of history. But now we move into atonement category and atonement territory because, secondly, Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of victory. Now, when you come to verse 6, you are caught by surprise. What you read about is not what you expect. We were told back in verse 5, look for the lion. I always think of Aslan. Uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, that big majestic figure, something like that. So we're looking for a great lion figure. And then also we're looking for the, the root of David, this great figure of source of blessing. But that's not what we see. Look at what it says in verse 6. And between the throne, the four living creatures, we also meet them in chapter 4. They're angelic beings of worship. Uh, they have the characteristics both of the seraphim and the cherubim combined together. And so between the throne and the Four living creatures and among the elders, I saw not a lion. I saw not the root of David, no. I saw a lamb standing, but he looks as if he had been slain. Now, I could spend the rest of the morning and into the afternoon talking about the theology of the lamb that runs from Genesis to Revelation, but I'm not going to do that. So don't worry. We're not going to be here that long. So I'm going to give you what I would call the Reader's Digest version, all right? First of all, the word lamb occurs 29 times in the book of Revelation. 28 times it is a reference to the Lord Jesus. One time it is a reference to the false prophet who looks like a lamb, but he speaks like the devil. You can go read about him more later in chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. So he's a counterfeit. He looks like a lamb. He looks like he's on God's side. But he, folks, remember, we all know the, the colloquial saying, looks can be what? Deceiving. Deceiving. Don't pay attention to what people look like. Listen to what comes out of their mouth. I don't even care if they stand behind a pulpit. I don't even care if they've got a Bible in front of them. Sometimes the greatest false teachers are right in that position. no. There are 29 occasions for the use of the word lamb. 28 times it is a reference to the Lord Jesus. One time it is a reference to the false prophet. There is, by the way, one other occasion where the word lamb, this particular word, it's the Greek word arneos, occurs in the Bible, and that is in the book of John, chapter 21, when Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Then go and what? Feed my lambs. And so he says, I looked and I saw something startling. I see a lamb, it's standing, but it looks as if it had been slain. He looks as if he's been sacrificed. And I'm convinced that in the background of John's thinking here is that great suffering servant passage of Isaiah chapter 53, one of the most magnificent passages in all of the Bible. You'll know verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon who? The lamb, the sins, the iniquities of us all. He looks as if he has been slain. That speaks of his death. But he is standing. That speaks of his glorious resurrection. By the way, just as an aside, many times in my life and in my ministry, I've had people ask me the question, uh, Brother Danny, when we get to heaven, will we see God when we get to heaven, will we see God? And I believe the Bible is crystal clear, yes, we will. 
We'll be able to see him because then we'll be glorified and every taint of sin will be removed. And so it's not like when we read in the Bible that when people look at God, they fall as if they're dead. No, we'll be able to look at him and and see him. But I know this much for sure. When we get to heaven, we will see Jesus. And when we see Jesus, even in his glorified state, he will still bear the marks of having been slain. That's what John says. We'll see the scars in his hands. We'll see the scar at his side. We'll see the scars in his feet. And it will be an eternal reminder, as Hebrews says, without the shedding of his blood. Folks, we don't apologize for the blood. We're not ashamed of the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we will be reminded for all of eternity that he shed his blood for you and he shed his blood for me. Yes, he looks as if he's been slain, but no, no, no. He is standing because he is the resurrected Lord. So he is victorious because he is slain. He is victorious because he is standing. But now it gets kind of tricky. He is also victorious because he is strong. Uh, The Bible says that, yes, he is standing. He looks as if he's been slain, but he's got seven horns. And he's also got seven eyes. And these are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. Now, what in the world does that mean? A number of years ago, when we were living here in Dallas, uh, I was invited to a church to uh, do a prophecy conference. And uh, I decided that one of the messages that I would bring was on Revelation chapter 5. And I explained it very much like I'm explaining it to you right now. Well, when we got in our van to go home, my four sons, God blessed us with four sons, twins, and then two more. Uh, At that time, I guess they were somewhere around 9, 9, 7, and 5 ballpark. So we got in the van to go home, and Jonathan, one of my twins, said, Dad, um, We did not like your sermon this morning. (laughs) Now, Daniel, I don't know about you, brother, but that's not what I want to hear from anybody, much less my kids. And so I was kind of taken back. I thought I'd actually done pretty good. And so I said, well, guys, why, why did you not like my sermon? And they said, well, you said Jesus in heaven has seven horns sticking out of his head. You also said he's got seven eyes across his face. And if that's what Jesus looks like, we don't want to go to heaven. Well, that's a real dilemma. I mean, you want your kids to want to go to heaven, I think. And so I looked over at my wife, and all she said was, you pick the text, honey. You take care of it. That's all the help I got that morning from my my precious wife. And so I very quickly began to rack my brain. And I think you'll appreciate my illustration because I said, well, guys, let me ask you a question. Who is our favorite football team? And boom. The Dallas Cowboys. We love the Dallas Cowboys. I said, yeah, we love the Cowboys. Now, let me ask you a question. Are they really Cowboys? And Nathan, the other twin, said, no, Daddy, they're not Cowboys. They're football players. I said, that is right. So why do we call them Cowboys? And they thought for a moment, and they said, well, Daddy, Cowboys are supposed to be tough. Cowboys are supposed to be strong. And I said, yeah, that's what they're supposed to be. Hadn't been that in quite a while, but that's what they're supposed to be. And so I said, guys, Revelation uses symbolic language, like the cowboy is a symbol for our football team. So when the Bible says he has seven horns, that doesn't literally mean he's got seven horns sticking out of his head. No, in the Bible, horns are often a symbol of strength or power. Seven, remember, we said is the number of perfection. So you put together, he's got perfect power. We use the word omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is the strong one, all right? But secondly, he is also victorious because he is searching. What do your eyes do? Your eyes see. Your eyes and my eyes are the primary means whereby we gain what? Knowledge. So, seven eyes, seven perfection. Eyes, knowledge, put it together. He's got perfect knowledge. He's all-knowing. We use the word omniscient. But then the really tricky one, which I believe represents that he is sovereign. These are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, we know this morning we're all orthodox in here, aren't we? They're not seven spirits of God. There's only one Holy Spirit of God. But that number speaks of what? His perfection, his completion, perhaps in this text his fullness. Because where does the spirit go? Well, the spirit goes into all 
of the earth, which speaks of our Lord's being omnipresent, everywhere present. And folks, let me just say this, and I'll move on. If all I had was this verse in the Bible, I would know that Jesus is God. Why? Because only God is all-powerful. Only God is all-knowing. Only God is everywhere present. And then look at what happens. He came, verse 7, and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Some years ago, a man wrote these words. Mary had a little lamb. His soul was white as snow. And everywhere his father sent, the lamb was sure to go. He came to earth to die one day, the sin of man to atone. But now he reigns in heaven above. He's the lamb upon the throne. And Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. Jesus Christ is the Lord of victory. And number three, Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. In verses 8 through 14, we are introduced to three beautiful hymns that are sung in heaven to the praise of the Lamb. The first hymn is the praise of the saints in verses 8 through 10. The second hymn, he is praised by the angels, verses 11 and 12. And the final hymn, he is praised by all the creation, verse 13 and verse 14. I'm going to move through them very quickly, but look at how glorious the atonement is portrayed. Verse 8. And when he, that is the Lamb, the Son of God, had taken the scroll, the living creatures, the four of them, and the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb. Now, they were holding a harp, that's the instrument of praise, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So think about the picture. They fall on their knees. They are praising him with their harps. They are praying to him, and they begin to sing. And they sing a new kind of song. And listen to how they sing in heaven. Here it is. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. And why is he worthy? Four reasons are given. Number one, for you were slain. Number two, by your blood. You purchased. You ransomed people for God. And from where did you purchase them and ransom them? From every tribe and language and people and nation. Number three, you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. As kings, we reign. As priests, we serve. And looking to the either the millennial kingdom, which is what I think, but it could be the new earth, they will reign on the earth. Well, the angels are watching the saints sing, and they're not going to sit on the sidelines. No, 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 no. I looked. And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Again, during the medieval period, believe it or not, theologians debated this question. How many angels can sit on the head of a pen? Now, that was not a valuable use of their time, I want to tell you. What I can tell you is this. How many angels are there in heaven? A bunch. There's a bunch. There are myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Brothers and sisters, don't worry about how many angels there are. Do pay attention to what angels do. And what do they do in heaven? Well, they're singing, verse 12. And they're singing with a loud voice. And here's their song. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to what? To receive a sevenfold blessing. Look at it now. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might. Stop. You can't give God any of those things. You can acknowledge that he has them, but we can't give to God power. We can't give to God wealth. We can't give to God wisdom and might, but we can give God the last three things. We can give him honor. We can give him glory, and we can give him blessing. By the way, that word blessing, you'll know it. It's the Greek word eulogia, eulogia. We get our word eulogy from it. Now you say, whoa, 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 time out, Danny. Hold on. Isn't a eulogy something you do at a funeral? Well, usually. And isn't a eulogy where you say something good about the person who died? Hopefully, yes. But bottom line, it simply means a good word. A good word. Now, I've been picking about it, but the fact of the matter is, all you folks here in Dallas, and I used to live here for 15 years, you don't hesitate to say a good word about the Dallas Cowboys, even when it's not really honest. You, you, you just kind of self-deceive yourself. Next year will be better. 
We, we at least made the pay, playoffs last year. Yeah, we made it the year before too, and we don't win but maybe one game in the playoffs. It's been that way for a long, 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 long time. Now, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm a big Braves fan. Oh, by the way, Rangers. It won the World Series last year. I mean, what a glorious thing for folks here in this area. You had not won a championship in a long time, have we? I'm a Georgian. We didn't win championships for ages. And in the same year, the Braves win the World Series and the, my Georgia Bulldogs win a national championship. And if you want to talk about either one of them, uh, I can go for a long, long time because we do talk about what we love. We just do. So here's my question before we close. When's the last time you said a good word about Jesus? He died for you. He paid the full penalty of your sin. He took your place. He loves you. I mean, if we're going to talk about anything that's good, I can't think of anything more precious than Jesus. That's why we do believe in evangelism. That's why we do believe in world missions. But sometimes what we believe, we don't live out as faithfully as we should, do we? No, we should be saying a good word about Jesus as long as we have breath. By the way, you do realize there's one thing you can do today to praise and honor and worship Jesus you will not be able to do when you're in heaven. And that is to share the gospel with someone who's lost. There'll be no lost people in heaven. We only get to do that right now. So he is praised by the saints and the angels, but finally he is praised by all of creation. Look at verse 14 and... The four living creatures said, amen. So be it. We agree. And the elders, well, they fell down and they worshiped. And some translations will even add the phrase, they worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Imagine with me that before we finish our service in just a few minutes, the doors back there would open and suddenly coming down here and being in front of us, is the governor of the state of Texas, Governor Abbott. Whether you agree with his politics or not, he is your governor. And I think it would be right to acknowledge him in some significant and important way. And you know, imagine with me if before we finished, those doors were open and coming down here and standing in front of us was President Biden. Now, whether you agree with his politics or not, I, I really don't. But he is the president. He occupies an office that is worthy of respect. And even honor. I don't know about you, but I would probably stand as he made his way here. In front. I just would. I'd do it for any president. But imagine if before we leave, suddenly here in front of us was the Lord Jesus Christ. To stand would be so inadequate. To stand and applaud would almost be arrogant. No, there's only one rightful response for who he is. And what he did, and it's there at the end of verse 14, they fell down. They put their knees on the ground. They put their face on the floor. And they worshiped the one who died for them forever and ever and ever. The word worthy is a great word. But it really only applies rightly to one person in all the creation. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this magnificent text that reminds us of what you did for us on the cross. You were slain, but praise the Lord, you're now standing as the resurrected Savior. And Lord, again, when you died on that cross, you died in our place. When you died on that cross, you paid the penalty of our sin. When you died on that cross, you bore the wrath that rightly should have fallen on us, but it fell on you. And Lord, we just simply want to say, praise be to God for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Lord, we love you. Help us to speak it as often as we possibly can because you are worthy. You are worthy. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.